got here this morning, I went through what I was going to say, and I heard a speaker say something. I said, I'm not going to say that now. I heard another speaker say something. I said, well, I'm not going to talk about that now. And I heard a speaker say, well, there's that. And I said, well, that's, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. And then Frank Gaffney on our panel went up there and killed it. <laughs> I mean, so what I decided to do is I, I decided I would talk about the things, you know, for people who know me, I drill things into the ground. But I think today I'm just going to go and talk about the things at a top level because it's maybe time to just pull it together, maybe the way I think about it, and maybe point to things that maybe need to be thought about. Is that fair? Can, can we pull up the uh, PowerPoints? And I only have a few, and they're not my typical types. You know, but I'd like to do to start off with, you know, make two little vignettes here. And one has to do with what Pam Geller said today about people having to get over it with Trump if they were coming from the more conservative side. And what I'd like to say, because I get into this discussion a lot in D.C. lately, and I was asked to write something on it, and that is this. Trump's victory may not be your victory, and I can understand people who are there on that, but you need to rest assured that his defeat is your defeat. And if he gets rolled up, if he gets rolled up on these issues, you know, when you, do an, when you do analysis as an intel person, one of the ways you define who's on your side, or just looking at something neutral, are the enemies they attract and the ferociousness of those enemies. And I am telling you, whether you like him or not, and whether he really fits your paradigm for politics, and, and I'm, not, I'm not even contesting that with people, the veracity, the ferociousness of which both the left and the Islamic community go after Trump tells you there's something about what he's saying that is so true to them that they feel they have to pull out all the, all the stops. And that should in itself be kind of an indicator. Sound fair? So, so I'm, not just, I'm not saying get over it, I'm just saying you know, take a minute because there are, more than, there are more than a couple great wars that have been lost because people who could have won the battle couldn't settle their differences going into it. The other thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, before I, I, should I talk about my main topic, is there's a couple people here, Elizabeth Sadoff wolf and Henrik Clausen, and I'd like you to stand up. Because a couple years ago, I'm getting these calls from these guys from Europe, and they're saying, Steve, you have to come to Europe and go to this thing in Warsaw, Poland, called the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And I said, what? <laughs> he says, oh, yes. This is the place where the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC, is integrating their narratives into the international di diplomatic circles. And then through those, and through those machinations, that's where we see the diplomatic community heavily influenced by Soros. And I, we're not going into that. Put this into the common parlance in what we are called, what I call facially neutral language, language that doesn't have any fingerprints on it, so that you can enforce Islamic hate speech codes and not know it. And lo and behold, what we came across, we saw all the social media entities, the big players, there negotiating with these people. So what I'd like to point out is why we were there. We were in Warsaw a couple years back, and I'm looking for my notes here. We were in Warsaw a couple years back, and we got people on an Islamophobia panel. Now, the, o uh, the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, is a formal, official, diplomatic function. So we're not talking about an organization. This is a diplomatic presence. So we are there to put things on the record. And we were there, and w there was a conference on Islamophobia, and we got both the left-wing element who wrote the Islamophobia narrative and the lead spokespeople for the OIC, the Turkish delegation, to admit that Islamophobia has no definition. Okay, why is that important? I'm gonna tell you why it's important. Because there's a huge effort to criminalize people who are accused of Islamophobia. And when you have a term like Islamophobia, which the players involved admit has no actual definition, that means you've given the state the power to arrest you for any reason or no reason at all, call it Islamophobia, and by the time they drop charges on you, you're bankrupt. Is that not scary? Last summer, we actually trekked off to Vienna. And Vienna had a formal, this is, I, keep, I can't emphasize this, this is a diplomatic function, so this has some state authority behind it. We, the United States, attends these functions in an official capacity. And we went there, and we started querying a panel. And the panel was talking about hate crimes and hate speech. 
And of course, one of the people there said, do you know what? Calling the Islamic State the Islamic State should constitute a hate crime. And so we kind of teared ourselves out, and one person went forward and asked a question, then, then Henrik went out and asked a question, something to the effect of, and you know, he can correct me, he says, well, are you saying that calling the Islamic State the Islamic State is a hate crime? Because they call themselves a hate crime. And the answer was something to the, like to this. Well, when they call themselves the Islamic State, that might be one thing, but when you call it the Islamic State, you're reinforcing a stereotype. And as such, that constitutes hate speech. Um, for the people who were there, please chime in if I've missed this point or, or, or misstated it. So I was batting cleanup, and my question was, okay, so let me ask this question. Are you saying that things known to be true, everybody stipulates the truth of the statement, and are you saying things known to be true that are properly stated can constitute hate speech? And you know what the answer was? At a formal international delegation working on this is countering violent extremism and hate speech narratives, you should associate those two. The answer put out was yes. That saying something known to be true can constitute hate speech. Okay, now for those who want me to go back and talk about facially neutral language, that's, the, that's to use language that seems neutral but is actually quite harsh. It should not be lost on anybody that when non-Muslims speak about Islam in a derogatory manner, even if it's correct, that is considered slander against Islam. And that is the objective of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation going all the way back to 2005 when, as an organization, all the heads of states of the OIC, all 57 member states, all the Islamic countries got together and said, we are gonna pass a law making defamation of Islam a crime in every jurisdiction, and we're gonna work through the international bodies on one level, and we're gonna work through state organs on another. One manifests itself as UN Resolution 1618, which the Secretary of State at the time, Hillary Clinton, met on October, uh, July 15, 2011. She met the, the head of the OIC, Ekmeleddin Isinoglu, in Turkey and said, the, our State Department will use its best efforts to go after anybody who challenges this, and we will use, and here's the quote, plain old-fashioned techniques of peer pressure and shaming. The other vector was you, uh, is the CVE, the Countering Violent Extremism Narrative. I just want to point out, when you talk about violent extremists, it's not an accident that anybody who joins the army and takes an oath to support and defend, by the definition of the CVE, is an extremist. Anybody who actually takes up arms in support and defense of the Constitution is by definition a violent extremist. Now for those who want to go do a, a Lexus search on the past 100 Times articles on the CVE, no matter how often the article starts talking about bin Laden and ISIS, it always ends up with people talking about the Constitution. Make sense? So I just think this is, this is, that was my little vignette, and I just want to uh, continue going here. Um, those events we actually had recorded and we had them posted. So we have an actual electronic record of those things. We need to know that freedom can die. Freedom can die through the CVE because the CVE is designed when something like Orlando happens, that when you're talking about a man who said, I'm a member of ISIS and I'm killing because of it, your media and your state leaders can stand there, look you in the face, and say, well, this was a violent extremer, extremist, and we don't know if he was a lone wolf or he was a self-radicalized person. Do you understand all that language is nonsense? That you have to have a professor? Did anybody notice as part of the CVE when the stories first came forward, both in San Bernardino and especially at, at, um, in Orlando, that along with the first responders was a Muslim Brotherhood Associated Imam who set the narrative. We need to put the uh, slides up. Um, did, did anybody notice that? So I think it's important to understand that the, the CVE and language like that exists to replace the language of facts and evidence. Who is he? He said he was a, he was a member of uh, ISIS. Why did he say he killed? He said he was killing according to their objectives. But what did they talk about? They talked about his latent homosexuality. 
this or that. They wanted to talk about some kind of idiopathic behavior. You know, it's not as new as you think it is that this that branding people mentally ill. It's important to understand that this war is fought in terms of narratives. And the narrative is this, that if I can say someone's crazy, there's no reason to do a forensic analysis of why he acted. Because ever, anybody who's crazy, that's just idiopathic. What's the point of figuring out what a crazy guy did? You see, that becomes the off-ramp for having to say, we have to analyze why he killed based on the reasons he stated when he stated fidelity to an Islamic cause that called for the action. Our freedom can die with UN Resolution 1618 and the hate speech narratives. I just think it's so important to say that. Now, you know, it's interesting today, earlier I was talking to Trevor Loudon, and I was talking about the hate speech narrative and how important it is to understand that that is the mechanism by which the hard left and the Islamists um, pull together a common narrative that's going to be used to attack you. We can actually get the data points and the documents to show how they're gonna do that. And I did it in the context of discussing something called the Maoist insurgency model, which we're gonna construct as a good way to understand the Brotherhood. And what Trevor told me is it's really interesting you say that because of course the hate speech narrative came out of the Maoist insurgency model. And I thought, well that's an interesting data point. It's another, it's another example of that. So, I think it's interesting, let's just continue with this Maoist insurgency model. We trained the Maoist insurgency model because we knew that that model, how Mao did his insurgents, insurgencies, we knew that if we knew that, we could crack groups. How is it that at a time when we have an organization, and one of the key words for the Maoist insurgency movement is the counterstate. That's a term of art. And a counter-state is an entity that sets itself up in a country for the purpose of being a counter-government, for the purpose of growing, becoming insurgent, and taking over. How is it that at a time when an entity says they're coming to America to perform a grand jihad and eliminating, destroying America and creating a, a civilization alternative, you could literally parse this into a Maoist statement. How is it that at a time when we see the rise of this organization, the very concept of, violent, the very concept of, of insurgency, the very concept of the Maoist groups, the very concept of counterintelligence has disappeared. Do you see, the racism, sexism, homophobia discussion is actually based on what? The denial of your identity. If you're, you're a sexist, if you say I'm a man or a woman, you are a, you're a racist if you say you're American or you're, you're, you're uh, Danish or you're German or Austrian. So you have these things going forward, and do we have them? I'd just like to point this out, because I see where, you know, Batting cleanup means you also sometimes have to kind of cut it short. We, how much time do we have? Zero. Okay. <laughs> Three minutes? Yeah, I'll take two minutes. two minutes. I'd like to point this out. This is a famous quote I have. It's from Sun Tzu. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. And it will be good that we end on these pictures because that's a picture's worth a thousand words and also a couple minutes of talking. So here we have the, a, a general for our special operations group, and he says this last year. We do not understand the movement, and until we do, we are not going to defeat it. We have not defeated the idea. We do not even understand the idea. Do you understand that when the person who deploys your special forces assets in the war on terror is saying that, you can make the argument that he doesn't even know who he's killing. But let's take a look at this. Because what I'm arguing here is the enemy plans to win the war through the information battle space by getting themselves into our decision making and media loops and putting bad information in, like the CVE, okay? And it's designed to create a complete, a complete breakdown of your ability to think rationally. And you have a general who's in charge of something very important saying this. But here you have McCain and, Lin uh, and Lindsey Graham right next to um, Abdul Hakim Belhaj giving him an award. Who here does not know who Abdul Hakim Belhaj is? <laughs> I, I knew that. Well, Abdul Hakim El Belhaj was somebody we caught and renditioned. So we knew he was Al Qaeda. He is currently the head of ISIS in Iraq. Okay, he is what the experts call really bad. And, and, and we knew it. We actually had his DNA. So, oh, so here you have McCain giving an award to Bel Hodge on a trip to Libya. So I want you to think about this. 
Our leaders on both sides of the aisle, have their understanding, they are in a complete state of strategic incomprehension, having ad adopted a narrative that is designed not to define. And these are the people making decisions on who those vetted moderates are that keep coming in and getting our training and weapons and then go back and join Al-Qaeda. Is it the 50 hundredth time that happens that you should start saying there's a problem there? This is the thing I ask. But the other thing to take a look at here is this. Aren't these the people who are also vetting the refugees coming in? So here we have uh, Congressman McCain who, held, who, who, who heads the um, Homeland Security and he basically tells us the greatest, the greatest uh, weapon we have are moderate Muslims, uh, that's our most effective weapon. But he is the head of CARE in, in Texas, this man. So all I like to do, and I'll, and I'll end it right here, okay? Well, you know when you're the last, you know that's gonna happen. So I, I actually told them I would accordion my, my presentation, especially as things kind of fell out. So here is, we have San Bernardino. How many people recognized that, like Orlando, you had a Muslim Brotherhood Imam go to TV and talk and set the narrative before the FBI came and had, was able to say anything about the case? That was the first instance where we saw the Brotherhood control every element of that investigation. It happened in Orlando. But what I want to point out here is, if you see, that's Loretta Lynch, the secretary, the, the um, the Attorney General, and this is when the day of the killing, she was at that, she was at Muslim Advocates giving a speech where she said that the, the Justice Department would, would go after anti-Muslim speech that edges toward violence. Just like Islamophobia does not mean anything. But I want to point something out. There's the Muslim Advocates logo underneath, promoting freedom and justice for all. Now, here's the thing. The average person, well, that's just like with liberty and justice for all, isn't it? But think about this. Here is Loretta Lynch, and Loretta Lynch is on a DS promising to go after Americans, and that is, that, is, that is the slogan for the Muslim Brotherhood, freedom from the laws of man, justice according to Sharia, and that's why it's the name of Muslim Brotherhood parties, Freedom and Justice Party. So with that, what I'd like to point out and, and bring to a conclusion, and, and thank you for having me, is that we need to get ourselves focused on the narrative and that it's a killer narrative and it is seamlessly fused and integrated between the hard left who are actually the, the people who created the, the ARC model and, and the Brotherhood. And we really need to look at them the way we would look at an insurgency abroad. Thank you very much. It's really the thing that makes this day practically impossible. There is so much we all want to hear and know. It's next, next time we do this for two days. Yes. Okay, okay yes. Um, what I wanted to do super fast before I bring up Jim Simpson, who will introduce Ambassador Bolton, I have to introduce our board. They made all this possible. We have Michael Greer, who's the president of AFA. We have Bill Becker at the back. We have Mark Shaw, Olga Matlin, Howard Hyde, Marsha Jacobs, Joe Peterson, Reuben Gordon. Do I have everyone? Uh, Gary Aminoff. <laughs> Gary Aminoff. <laughs> Anybody else? That's our board, and we have a number of fabulous supporters and donors without whom none of this could be possible. One last thing before we move on. Please stand and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> 